Hey, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens and this is English Nerd. So it's, it feels like it's been a little while anyway since I've done a poetry analysis and so that is what I'm doing today. Today it's going to be God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. I already did one of his poems, my very favorite of his, Carrion Comfort. Uh, about a year ago and this has to be my second favorite Hopkins poem and it fits really well with the season of Christmas which is when I'm recording this. So without further ado here is some analysis of the poem God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Alright here is that poem God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins. It starts this way. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. So let's just start with that. One of the things that I like about this poem is that it's not your typical Christian poem. It's not platitudes and things like that that tend to characterize a lot of modern Christian poetry, unfortunately. Instead, this one has a lot of wordplay and layers to it. Hopkins really liked to play with meter, and that's not something I'm going to be focusing on with today's analysis, but I will be looking at a lot of the wordplay and the meaning behind what he's saying. So the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Charged is the first word that should stand out to you um, as having a double meaning. So the world is charged with the grandeur of God, charged in the sense of electricity. It's like it has this grandeur of God within it, deep within um, nature in particular, as we'll see as the poem goes on. But it also has the meaning of the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Like it has this responsibility to, uh, to at least acknowledge that grandeur in nature. So keep in mind that double meaning. It, that is the grandeur of God, will flame out like shining from shook foil. You have to admit that that is some really great alliteration there, shining from shook foil. You can picture that so clearly, how when you shake foil there are those, uh, it just starts shining and glittering. So uh, it says, it gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. So again, we get some alliteration. It's not quite as strong as the first set, um, but we have a couple of similes here. They're similes because we have like or as with the comparisons. So the grandeur of God flames out in this sporadic kind of beautiful way. And it also gathers like the ooze of oil crushed. So it becomes more precious oil does when it is crushed. And notice that crushed is all the way over here in its own line. There's something that is meant to stand out about that sense of, of um, something being crushed, being destroyed in order for greatness to kind of come out of it, which is reminiscent of um, Jesus, of course. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? So wreck is, is related to the idea of reckoning, like, oh, I, I reckon this, I, I think, about this, I, I consider this. So why are people not paying attention to um, God, but his rod in particular? So that has to do with, with guidance, with consequences, with punishment even, but it has a, an association, biblically at least, with the idea of being led in the right direction. So, so if this is the case, if the grandeur of God is just charged into the natural world, why do people not pay attention? Also notice that it says, why do men then now not wreck his rod? This is something that Hopkins does a couple times in this poem. He puts words next to each other that seem like they ought to have a word in between then and now, maybe. Um, we'll see that up here, or down here rather, with deep down things. It should be deep down in things, but Hopkins wants to really solidify how, how God is so close to humanity and to nature that there is really no separation at all. And so he leaves out some of these words just to glue the words themselves together like God is close to his, his creation in, in the case of this, this poem. 
So continuing on, generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and all wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. There's a lovely cadence to this. Um, again, I'm not going to go really into meter here, but we have this gorgeous repetition. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. You get this sense of this trudging along uh, through all of the generations again and again and again. And then he says, all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. So there's something about just the focus on, on work and people just trudging along, oblivious to the grandeur of God around them. This poem reminds me a little bit, at least right here, of The World is Too Much With Us by William Wordsworth, which is another poem that I analyzed, and I'll put the, the um, link in the comments, or not the comments, but the uh, area below, uh, because it's a similar idea. And where's man smudge and shares man smell? The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. The part of this that stands out to me the most is the idea that the foot cannot feel being shod. Shod just means having shoes on. And so because we have all of this trade that we've been doing, all of this that separates us essentially from the ground. So in the case of a shoe, a literal separation between our bodies and nature there's something that disconnects us from the grandeur of God, which does shine out and gather in this beautiful way in the natural world. Instead, humans have, have destroyed a lot of that nature and thus their connection to um, its creator. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Before I go on, it gets the syntax gets pretty complicated here. Syntax just being the word order. So let's look at this first. Nature is never spent. So he's, he spends this time setting up how the grandeur of God is infused in nature, how humanity is disconnected from that in this fundamental way. And yet nature is not spent. There is still the opportunity to reconnect with nature and its creator. And here's that other example of the missing word in order to emphasize the closeness of these concepts here. So there lives the dearest freshness deep down things. So the freshness is so deep down, so so integral to to nature, to these things that they're, it, it's not even in things, it's part of the things themselves, um, which is why I think that that word is missing. And this is not just a typo. If you're wondering to yourself, is this a typo in my particular version? No, it is not. I've looked at various versions of this poem and there is no in there. And though the last lights off the, west, uh, off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. These final four lines took me quite a while to figure out, and that is because of the insane syntax here. So let me break it down for you. And though the last lights off the Black West went, there ought to be a comma there to clarify things, um, if that was what Hopkins was going for. So the last lights have left. Um, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, and so there's this deep darkness in the west. It says, the, although this is the case, the last lights have gone in the west, there is this blackness, this deep darkness. Oh, morning, so this is the next subject uh, of, the, of the next clause, at the brown brink eastward springs. So morning springs, although there is this deep darkness to the west. To the east, we see the possibility of this new light. So again, we get the juxtaposition of the um, God-created hope as shown in nature with the morning springing to life, and then it's juxtaposed with the deep darkness, with the lights kind of going out with this disconnection with sight and feeling that we get in the end of this 
stands up here. Because, and here we get the reason for this beautiful opportunity at morning, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. So the Holy Ghost here, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is over everything with this angelic, bird-like imagery, um, which is, again, biblical. Um, Christ does talk about how he would like to gather um, his people under his wings and, and things like this. And so it's this almost maternal image of this bird um, close to close to the world, which fits in with, again, the idea that God and the natural world, like birds, um, are very, very close together. So in this poem, Hopkins identifies this problem that humanity has and then the possibility for this beautiful hope because the world is charged with the grandeur of God. I hope you enjoyed that and got something out of it. As always, make sure if this is for an assignment that you do your own investigation and don't just take my ideas. But I hope that you were able to look at the poem from a different point of view and that you got something out of this. All right, that's it. Like this video if you like it. Do not forget to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness. And I will see you soon.